Another thing that uh, I want to talk to you about this morning is in the history of man, there's not been very many, not much time at all that there's not been war on earth. In fact, today we have the war over in the Middle East going on. There's been wars and Jesus even said this, in the last days there's going to be more wars and rumors of wars and all these things are going to continue. So, um, you know, the Bible very plainly says in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, it says there is a time for war, there's a time for peace. Amen? So what makes it a time for war? Because, you know, don't, don't we want peace? Doesn't really the world want peace, maybe, uh, for most everybody? Sure. But here's the thing. There comes a time that when things cannot continue the way they're going, so you have to declare war. Hmm? And uh, can't be resolved, don't seem like, any other way. You know, if you have aggression coming against you, now, it could be against our nation, or it can be against you individually. You can take a stand and say, this aggression will not stand any longer. You know what you've just done? You've declared war. Mm. All right, in talking about that, we know we as believers have an adversary called the devil, right? I want you to go with me in your Bible to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And the first three verses uh, is where the Apostle Paul is actually vindicating his apostleship. Now we know that Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, then he wrote 2 Corinthians. And here is what was happening to the great apostle, is that there was some people that were accusing Paul of worldly motives. And that's what he said uh, here uh, in verse 2, I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Now, if there's one thing that I have determined out of the Word of God, it's hard to find where the great apostle Paul walked after the flesh after he got saved, right? This was a spirit-driven man. Now, they were accusing of him of, of worldly motives, and also, not only that, that he was using uh, actually human uh, weapons and human ways of doing things to accomplish the work that he was doing. And I'm telling you what, he did a great work for God, no question about it. Started churches, uh, a lot of the New Testament. You can give thanks for the Apostle Paul being the one God used to, um, to give us the New Testament. Now, Verse 4, in verse 3, he does say this. He said, we don't walk in the flesh, and we do not war after the flesh. There's that word war. We don't, we're not warring against or after the flesh. In fact, uh, we don't war against the flesh. If you're warring against the flesh, you are fighting the wrong warfare, right? Okay. Now, in verse 4... Here's what the apostle says. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Not carnal. All right? Now, um, warfare has been a, a continuing theme 
uh, a reoccurring theme, if you will, especially throughout the New Testament. Now, we know there's a lot of wars and battles fought in the Old Testament too, but we're talking here about spiritual warfare, and it is a reoccurring theme. Uh, I'm going to relate a few scriptures here this morning in that regard. In the book of Ephesians chapter 6, you can drop down about verse 10. Uh, the apostle here is saying, you know, uh, to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might and put on what? The whole armor of God. Now, why would you put on an armor? It's because you're going to have to go out and fight, right? So you put on an armor. Get ready for battle. So there again, there's, you know, put it on. It didn't say just when you feel like you've got a fight coming on. He said put it on and wear it day after day after day. Somebody said, well, where do I find this armor? God gives it to you. Amen. You don't have to go out here and buy it at some store and pay too much for it. God will give it to you if you'll just wear it. How about that? That's a good thing right there. And... Um, also, I, I want us to look uh, in 1 Timothy, if you will, uh, in chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1, and uh, let's go down to verse 18. And here's what the Apostle Paul tells the young man Timothy at this time. He said, this charge, he's given a charge unto Timothy here, and he says, I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee. Now, Timothy had different people apparently that had prophesied over him and told him the things that uh, was going to happen in his ministry. Now, I've had that done to me uh, when I was a young man. Uh, and um, I found out that uh, this is a, a work of God in itself. But here's what he tells Timothy. He says, That thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Amen? So we fight not just any old warfare, church. We fight a good warfare. And that's what I'm wanting to talk to you for a while today is the importance of a good warfare. And, uh, and he gives us a little bit more uh, information on this in 2 Timothy. Um, uh, 3 and 4, I believe it is. Um, uh, okay, 2 Timothy. Yeah. Uh, he, he tells uh, the, the apostle does here, and then also, let me go on down to chapter 4, verse 7, where um, the apostle Paul says, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, and I have kept the faith. Now, the good fight is mentioned again here. I have fought a good fight. That's what we all want to be able to say when we come down to the end of our lives here on this earth. Now, going back here, uh, the word warfare and weapons go together, right? A weapon is an instrument used in combat. A weapon. Now, a weapon can be an offensive or it can be defensive. They're all needed, right? Offensive weapons are needed. Defensive weapons are needed if you're going to war. And um, so what the apostle is saying here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he is telling us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Now, I, I feel like need to dwell on that some before we even go on into some other things that I really want to get into, but, but first I have to deal with this because 
it's so easily because we have an enemy that do doesn't mind for us fighting, but he does not want us to fight a good warfare. You hear me? Does not want us to fight a good one. He wants us to fight a carnal warfare. Right? A carnal warfare. He doesn't mind you to fight that. You know what? If you fight a carnal warfare, you're going to be using his weapons. <laughs> and you think the devil's going to give you weapons that will destroy himself? No. He's going to give you weapons that's going to blow up in your face and destroy you. Listen to that. So you have to be very careful here and make sure that when you take on an enemy, whatever the enemy is, that you have to fight not with carnal weapons, but the Bible says mighty weapons of God. So here, our weapons are not physical. They are not even human. How about that? Wow. And uh, they are not, and this is the most important thing that I think we need to understand here, they are not man-devised. Men, people, like to come up with weapons and things to use to help defeat enemies in people's lives. And every one of them, if they're man-devised, they're not of God. Amen? Now, go with me to the book of Romans, chapter 8. And I want us to look down at verse 5. Let's start with Romans 8, verse 5. Once again, the Apostle Paul is saying here, talking about, uh, you know, the flesh and the spirit. He said, there are about some that are after the flesh. He said, the people that are after the flesh mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, they mind the things of the Spirit. Right? 4, verse 6, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. In other words, to be carnally minded, being death, means that a person is living in a sense and a reasoning, reasoning realm. In other words, they're being led by their senses. They are being led by their reasonings. And because of that, those things lead to death. They lead to death. They are fleshly minded, fleshly motivated. And these are the things here that the Apostle Paul uh, was warning us about. Now notice verse 7, same chapter 8. He said, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, is against God, it's hostile. Think about that. Carnal-mindedness is hostile against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So they, they are in the flesh. Flesh and carnality are synonymous terms. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, the thinking here of relying upon these things in the reason and sense realms, the reason 
that kind of thinking is hostile and actually it's rebellious against God. Now that's the realm that Satan wants to keep you in. Let me tell you, that's where he wants to keep you. Because if he keeps you there, he's got you. Now, notice here, in, let's go to 1 Corinthians. That's uh, the reason Paul, uh, he wrote 2 Corinthians. But let me tell you, 1 Corinthians, he had uh, a lot of things here he had to deal with in the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, and I want us to look at verse 3, um, he tells this church that they were carnal. He said, there is among you, there's envying and strife and divisions. And he said, are you not carnal and walk as mere men? Now, uh, in Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth, he had to do a lot of correcting and a lot of rebuking because they were actually people in that church that was doing those things that just mentioned their envy and strife, bitterness, and all these things of divisions in the church. Now, uh, he rebuked them strongly for their carnality. Now, the Apostle Paul, even in a place or two there, he had to deal in, in chapter 5, he had to deal with a situation in the church that was so unholy and ungodly that he turned in the spirit realm uh, a man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Now, what about that? Turning somebody, don't pray for him. Turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his. Now, that's gross sin, folks. That he, now, Paul didn't say that I don't care about him anymore, but he said that his flesh might be destroyed. Let me tell you something. If Satan is working in somebody's life and destroying them through the, a lot of things in the flesh, you know, the Bible does tell us that our bodies is the temple of the Holy Ghost, and if we defile them, you know, God's going to destroy. Somebody said, how does God destroy somebody that's defiling this temple? A lot of times, just let them go ahead and do it, and that, it kills them. Destroys the flesh. Think about it. So Paul had to do these things. Now, if you go over into 2 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 7, the Apostle Paul very plainly made this statement. He said, of the things I had to do, the first letter I wrote to you, he said, I do not repent of doing them. The reason Paul said, I cannot repent for doing that and, and re, uh, rebuking you like I did is because I was only obeying God. Now, he did go ahead and say, although I did repent. That means Paul was sorry for one thing, and that one thing was that he had to do it. But he could not repent for something that God told him to do, right? So anyway, it was a, a strong situation, but it resulted uh, in, in carnality. Now, here's another thing you need to know about carnality it can take on a real spiritual appearance. Did you know here in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and, uh, yeah, verse 7, the apostle Paul told him right off the bat, 1 Corinthians, he said, you don't come behind in any gift. In fact, this is a church that had the gifts of the Spirit working in it. But it was shot through and through with carnality. Think about it. Now, uh, so they, what they lacked in this church was discipline and wisdom. Discipline and wisdom. They lived too loose of a lifestyle. They were all about the things of the flesh and, and, and those type of things. 
Now, in the, in the realm of, I said, wisdom, uh, let, let me go to the book of James, if you will. And uh, James chapter 3, and we'll go down here to uh, verse 13. James says, Who is a wise man endured with knowledge among you? Let him shew out of a good conversation or lifestyle. We talked about that some in Sunday school this morning, our lifestyles and, and uh, things. Uh, his, uh, he shows forth out of a good lifestyle his works and meekness of wisdom. Meekness of wisdom. He said, if you have envy, uh, bitter envying and strife in your hearts, don't glory about that and lie not against the truth. Because this wisdom descendeth not from above, but he said this kind of wisdom is actually earthly, sensual, and devilish. Wow. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom from, that is from above is first what? Pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated. It's full of mercy good fruits, without partiality, and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. But if you don't have peace and you have contention against it, if you have earthly wisdom competing against heavenly wisdom, that's going to mean war. Hmm? They won't commune. What communion hath light and darkness? What fellowship hath righteousness and unrighteousness? The answer is zero. So there's a conflict there, right? Now, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians, I want to go back to that right quick, chapter 2. And I want us to look at verses uh, 5 and, and 6. Uh, in regard to that wisdom. He said, your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. It does come down to faith, church. But your faith, I said, your faith, my faith has to stand in the power of God. Wow. How be it? He said, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. All right, spiritually mature because, you know, that, that might explain it better. But we do not speak the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. I want to tell you something right now that God's salvation plan has nothing to do with worldly wisdom. Nothing. Beware. Now, the carnal mind, fascinating thing, isn't it? The carnal mind is weak when it should be strong. And it's strong when it should be weak. Huh. I'm going to say that again. The carnal ma mind is strong, is weak when it should be strong. And it's strong when it ought to be weak. You want me to explain that a little more? <laughs> okay. Uh, Second Corinthians. Uh, chapter 12. The Apostle Paul here is talking about his thorn in the flesh. And he says here in verse 7, he said, he had received many revelations of God. And he says, and lest I should be, notice this, exalted above measure through those abundance of revelations, 
There was the reason it was given to me, a thorn in the flesh, which was the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I, think about that, lest I, the great apostle Paul, should be exalted above measure. Hmm. Now, this, uh, the weakness here, even the apostle Paul found out that he had a weakness here, right? And uh, the weakness in a carnal-minded person is this. It tends to give glory to the flesh. Look at me. Attention and glory. That's carnality. When a strong spiritual mind, that's opposite of a weak carnal mind, a strong spiritual mind will immediately resist that temptation to get exalted. Hmm. Now, I read over in the Bible there where Jesus sent out in Luke chapter 10, 70 disciples. Jesus gave them authority over the power of the devil, didn't he? They did heal the sick. They even raised the dead. They cast out devils. They did all of these things. And when those 70 returned to Jesus... They said, look what we did. We cast out devils. Have a high five over here. Peter and John. Celebration time. Do you know what Jesus said? He said, don't rejoice. Don't rejoice. See, we want to rejoice over flesh, right? Don't rejoice because those devils were subject unto you, but do rejoice if your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Why did Jesus say that? Because he could see that same sin of pride that caused. Because in that same scripture, Jesus says, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. He knew he was there in the beginning when Satan did fall from heaven, was cast out with his angels. He was there. He saw what happened with that spirit of pride in Satan, and he did not want it happening in his disciples. Hmm. So let me tell you, the flesh wants its glory. Did you know the carnal mind can be strong? A lot of times it can be very strong-willed. You ever seen a strong-willed person? Stubborn person? I <laughs> oh, don't be looking at your neighbor this morning. Look up here. <laughs> I, I'm stubborn. I don't deny it. I'm stubborn. When it comes to compromise and truth and things like that, I'll dig my heels in. But I don't care a lot about hardly anything anybody else does, other whether it's right or wrong, I do. But no, I, but I am stubborn. There's an old commercial that uh, I think uh, Wells Lamont Glove says, we're stubborn about quality. Amen. Well, that's a good thing to be stubborn. But just to be a strong-willed, stubborn person is carnal, really. It really is carnal. Uh, Self-willed, unteachable, prideful, as we just mentioned. Now, what does this person need to do to get on the right track? They need to be submissive and humble themselves under the mighty hand of God. 
Amen? Amen? I'm exposing carnality this morning. If anybody wondered, <laughs> I'm trying to expose some things here this morning, right? Did you know the Apostle Paul wrote over in the book of Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. And he said, for the grace. See, the Apostle Paul learned something about grace over there, and we'll get back to 2 Corinthians 12 just in a minute. Don't lose your spot there. But he learned something about grace right there in that thorn in the flesh. He said, for the grace that is given to me, he said, those that uh, among you in that church at Rome, he said, not let any man think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but let him think soberly, because God has given to every man the measure of faith. Amen? So that's what, if you go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, that's what Paul is actually saying right here, because in 12.9, uh, Jesus said to Paul, he said, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in what? In weakness. You see in the difference between being uh, strong uh, physically or uh, carnally and then strong spiritually? Totally different. He said, most gladly, that's where he learned his lesson, most gladly, therefore, I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. God's trying to show him, if you keep this up and you let something go to your head, you're not going to have my power. The old timers used to say about people that let stuff go to their head. They had ways of making money back in those days. And one of them was, you know, if I could buy that person for what they're worth and sell them for what they think they're worth, man, I could make money. Hand over fist. Amen? No. It, it, it can't go there. So he said that I, when I am weak, in verse 10, that's when I'm strong. So you see in the difference between spiritual and carnal? Wow. Big difference, isn't it? Uh, Philippians. Philippians. Uh, uh, let's, let's look, and I'm, yeah, I need to continue and wrap this up. But anyway, Philippians chapter 3, verse 3 says this. We are the circumcision. Now, this is not circumcision of the flesh. This is circumcision of the heart, right? We that are of the circumcision, we worship God, how? In the Spirit, and we rejoice in Christ Jesus. And we have zero, no confidence in the flesh. Think about it. That was double zero, right? No confidence in the flesh. Huh. Well. And, and then in the book of Ephesians, um, Let's flip back over here to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 12. It gives us this scripture. Once again, the Apostle Paul says, referring back to verse 11, in Christ Jesus our Lord, talking about Him, in whom, in Christ Jesus our Lord, we have what? Boldness. And we have an access, access with confidence here. See, we went from no confidence to all confidence. Just like that. Praise God. We have uh, confidence by the faith of Him. Hmm. Have you learned that having confidence in the flesh does not work? Amen. 
what he's saying here in Ephesians 3 and 12 is our faith. Now we're getting somewhere. Our faith in Christ gives us the boldness to fight. Do you know what he told Paul told Timothy over there? He said, fight. The good fight of what? Faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Right? Lay hold on it. Don't turn loose of it. And then, the good fight of faith. Really, when you get right down to it, I think that's the only scripture in the Bible that tells us what fight to fight. Good fight of faith. Somebody said, well, I, I want to fight the devil. Well, for one thing, you're no match for him. <laughs> I want to fight everything that's going wrong in the world. Well, uh, you got your hands full. Right? Fight the good fight of faith. Now, uh, one other scripture here. Uh, go with me, Galatians. Go back one to Galatians uh, chapter 5. And uh, let's look at verses 16 and 17. Paul again saying, This I say, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh, listen to this, for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit. Have you ever noticed that in your life? I mean, you get thinking I'm, I'm God's filling me in His Spirit and everything, but then what is it that the devil uses to tempt you to disobey uh, the Spirit of God that's inside of you? It's the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eyes. It's these things that will pull us away. And the Bible says the Spirit... Uh, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And he said, these are contrary, different directions here, one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. If you be led by the spirit, you're not under that law, the curse of the law. So here's, here's the saying. Before, I am about ready to close. Before a man, woman, or anybody in the body of Christ can step out on the battlefield armed and dangerous in the sight of the devil, they have to win that war inside of them. Amen? You all agreeing with me? Have you ever fought that war inside of you? It can be a tough one sometime. Then, if we can win that, and what I've just told you the difference between carnality and spirituality there, if you get out of the carnal way of thinking into the spiritual way of thinking, then let me tell you something. You do become dangerous to the devil. I don't, I don't want to, uh, it, it, it's not a recreation room, it's a battlefield. Is that okay to say? Some people want to make everything a recreation room. What game can I play today? <laughs> Amen. It's not playing games, it's serious business. Amen, it's a battlefield. Now, in closing... I want to make these three points. What do I need to do within myself, Brother David, to be the best soldier in the army of God that I can possibly be? All right? To be that good warrior, your spirit has to be your master, your spirit man, okay? Now, this does not apply to an unsaved person. You may have heard it said before, you know, let your conscience be your guide. 
Don't ever tell an unsaved person that. <laughs> it's wide open, folks. <laughs> They'll say, yeah, I can steal and whatever. Don't bother me. Well, of course not. They're not saved. All right. If you have a reborn spirit, born, the incorruptible word of God, you're a new man, a new creature in Christ Jesus, then that spirit has to be your master. There is a spirit inside of you. And if it's alive, and if it's empowered by God's Holy Spirit, then you can know for a certain that greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. Now that ought to give you some boldness right there to take a step out and say, I'm ready to change things that are wrong. Amen? Here's the tricky one. Your soul has to be your servant. Your soul. What am I talking about here? I'm talking about your mind. I'm talking about your emotions. Somebody said, "You? no, I'm not against emotions. Oh, my. No, not at all. Uh, you just need to be able to control them sometimes, right? I, it's, it's about your feelings. Well, don't we? Yeah, we all have feelings. That makes up your soul nature, right? Yeah, your thinking, your mind, everything. Your soul has to be servant to your spirit because the spirit lusteth against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit, right? And if your spirit man, the one that's born again, let me tell you something, your mind did not get born again when you got saved. And I'm going to take another step. Your body did not get born again when you got saved. What was it got born again? Your spirit man. Right? What do you do with your mind? You renew it. Did I not just say that a while ago in the 12th chapter <laughs> Your mind's being renewed. How are you going to renew your mind? By this word of God. Mind's being renewed. That's what you do with it. And let me tell you, somebody said, well, that temptation's coming against me. Well, I can't do anything with my mind. Consult your spirit, man. You've got a conscience, by the way. Unless it's seared over, you've still got one. And then you consult, and then let your spirit man do something about this stuff that's going on up in here, between here and here. And you know what? Somebody said, I can't control my thoughts. How come? Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Sure you can. You can replace a bad thought with a good thought if you want to. <laughs> Whatsoever things are pure, lovely, good report. You know, Paul, give us a list. Think upon these things. Amen? <clears throat> Now, your mind has to be... You, you, you have a right to train your mind. God wants you to do something about it. All right, carnal-minded, keep that in mind. It's still in the Bible. Your body has to be your slave. If a person says, I got tempted, I believe it was God tempting me. No. No. Wasn't God. The Bible says, the book of James says, uh, God does not tempt the man, it cannot be tempted, neither tempteth he any man. Somebody said, Jesus was tempted. Yeah, but Jesus was tempted as a man, not God, in that regard. He was flesh. He was tempted in the fleshly realm. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. 
And when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death, carnal-minded death. All right? Be not deceived in man. Amen? 